Hello, my name is Ilona and well, okay, okay, in geography now, Russia, reaction, yeah. Hey everyone, we've reached Russia, the big guy. You've probably heard of him. For this episode, mm -hmm. I really wanted a real yeah. person to co-host with me. <laughs> One guy immediately popped up. Say hi to Mr. Mike. Born and raised in Russia, in childhood, speaks the language, mm -hmm. knows the culture. This dude is my go-to Russia guy. Uh, quick mm -hmm. disclosure, I've lived here in the States three times longer than I've lived in Russia. That said, mm -hmm. where I falter, this is a preemptive apology. Well, thank you, Mike. Either way, uh, it was either you or that Dimitri guy down my street. The crackhead? Oh. See how slim our options were? You're the best I got. <laughs> it's time to learn geography. No! Hey everyone, I'm your host Barbs here with Mike. Russia is a big country that everyone has heard of. Big? Mm, of course. Football is a country many of you guys have been waiting for on this channel. And this is gonna be a pretty Ooh. big episode. We're gonna cover as much as we can without rushing into it. Приветствуем вас на русский эпизод. Now, as we all know, by land area, Russia is the largest country on Earth. The country is so big, it's difficult to even get an accurate two-dimensional flat cutout of the nation due to the width of their land straddling a spherical mark on Earth's surface. And with lots of space comes lots of interesting geographical anomalies. Russia is so big that it has about one-eighth of all inhabited land on Earth and almost the same amount of surface area as the entire planet of Pluto. Russia is a transcontinental country that straddles both uh -huh. Eastern Europe and Northern Asia in a larger landmass known as Eurasia. It is often understood that the European part of Russia, where about 77% of the population lives, mm. is everything west of the Ural mountain range, and the remaining 23% live on the east side. At about 6,600 miles or 9,000 kilometers east to west, the country covers 11 mm -hmm. time zones and the longest border in the world with 14 different countries. Yes, mm. even North Korea at the very narrow tri point with China. In addition, they recognize two more disputed areas that they border North Ossetia and Abkhazia as countries, even though the international community recognizes these areas as part of Georgia. Also, also, the country has military bases mm -hmm. in nine countries abroad, including the breakaway mm -hmm. state of Transnistria in Moldova. And keep in mind, the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, the world's first and largest space launching facility, is actually leased out to Russia until 2050 and acts as like a Russian exclave. The country is divided into 85 federal subjects, two of which are disputed, and all are divided further into six categories. The 46 oblasts or provinces, these mm -hmm. are the most common subjects with direct control from the central government. Keep in mind, the westernmost point of Russia is actually in this detached exclave known as the Kaliningrad yeah. Oblast. Then you have the 22 republics. These are nominally autonomous areas that have the mm -hmm. right to their own constitution and language alongside with Russian, as many of them are inhabited by ethnic minorities with their own cultures. Yes. Then you have the nine krais or territories, which are basically just oblasts, but with a historical tie to being frontier regions, many of which are sparsely populated. You have the four autonomous okrugs or districts, which are like little sister areas that have a certain level it of autonomy. It seems uh, are still geography to in Russian These two oblasts are in charge really, of these three uh, okrugs, whereas the Chukotka Autonomous Okrug is the only one not subject to any oblast or cry. Then you have one mm. strange unit known as the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, which was kind of like a deliberately created entity that was supposed to be a new home for Russia's Jewish population, but, even though today less than 1% of the population is Jewish. And why it's so far somewhere? I don't know. And finally, well, that's you have the three federal cities, the two largest ones, Moscow, the capital of the country, yes. and St. Petersburg, yes. as well as yeah. the controversial yeah. disputed Sevastopol. Located I the visited the Russia once that is claimed by Ukraine, when I was a child, and it was St. Petersburg, it's a subject we'll talk about later. and short, it wasn't even St. Kind of Petersburg, but Len Leningrad. Any oblast. <laughs> and that was just the administrative division section. We didn't even like get into all the other weird stuff. Ago, like how this guy wants to buy the more. house of Romanov and possibly buy mm. land in the Balkans for a micronation. Or how the California Independent Republic actually has an embassy in Moscow. Or how they once had sovereignty over Alaska for over a hundred years yeah. known as Russian America. And was like, mm. ah! I got a piece of America. How you doing, settlers? <laughs> um, not so good. Oh, yeah. War against oh, the oh, Ottomans is costing yeah, me a fortune. Yeah, yeah. I need money. Whoa, there's a gold rush on the west coast in California. Let's all go, now. The Americans and the British Canadians might get closer and try to take over. It will cost more to defend my American territory that I don't even pay any attention to. Maybe I should just sell. Mm. Hey, UK, you interested? I've got quite enough Arctic tundra. I think I'm quite all right. USA? All that frozen, useless land, you better sell it to me for cheap. And that's how they sold it for only 7.2 million, which by today's inflation rates would be equivalent to about 130 million or about two cents per acre. For what it's worth, though, Russia kind of got its general land territory we know today from the conquests, mostly from Cossacks, that ended in the late 17th century, led by this dude. What is a Cossack? Well, long story short, it's kind of like this. Ah! 
I'm so sick of this pent-up aggression. I just need to get out of this town and get in a fight or something. Hey, you're an intrepid guy with a death wish who probably wouldn't mind maybe dying. How would you like to go out and get paid to do that for my country? How? Just like go out, make alliances with the locals, or I don't know, kill them. Just give me more uh, land to adventure. Like a like okay. a mercenary or something. Let's not call it that, but something like that. And that's basically how Russia grew from this to this. In any case, there's a lot more to the Russian scene than just political divisions. The capital and largest city is Moscow, where nearly a tenth of the entire population lives. It is the largest mm -hmm. European city, and as of 2020, is one of the top 20 largest cities by city proper on Earth, with over 13 million people. Here, of course, you can find the three biggest and busiest airports. Otherwise, St. Petersburg, the second largest city, has the fourth busiest airport. Just to skip away, St. Petersburg does hold the largest a shipping port, the port of St. Petersburg, right on the coast of the Gulf of Finland. The country has thousands of islands and islets off its coast, mostly mm, situated yeah. in the Arctic, but the largest one, Sakhalin, located in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. Going up, you see these two little guys here, the Diomede Islands? Yep, the big one on the left belongs to Russia, and the small one to the right belongs to the USA. And they sit right on the international date line, effectively meaning that even though they are only about two miles <laughs> apart, Big Diomede Island is an entire day ahead of the <gasps> Island. Speaking of which, they have about 23,000 miles of coastline, fifth long in the world, mostly in the Arctic, giving them the largest EEZ claim over the Arctic Sea. The country has a few territorial disputes. In Asia, you have the Kuril mm, Islands of course. with Japan, where both claim ownership over these islands just off the coast of Hokkaido. In the Caspian Sea, Kazakhstan claims these three islands that are currently under Russian control. And finally, you have the yeah, most mortal all dispute these that has made all the international so headlines recently, important. Ukraine and the Crimean Peninsula. In the shortest <sighs> way to summarize, in 2014, Russian troops took over and essentially the entire area was annexed by Russia following a controversial referendum as most people there are Russian and voted to secede themselves back to Russia. To this day, the international community does well, not recognize we this all know how referendums the area is still de facto Russia. run by Russia. This means that even further than Crimea, the entire Sea of Azov is also disputed. Otherwise, if you look at the population density map of Russia, most people mm -hmm. east of the Urals actually live close to the famed Trans-Siberian Railroad, mm -hmm. the longest rail line in the world that traverses the Well, Atlantic this is something really interesting. I really... China, and even want as North to experience this, but I don't know if it's possible Europe. even. To this day, there are no main highways that reach the furthest eastern subject, the Chukotka Autonomous Okrug, and anyone wishing to go there must fly or probably take an uncharted boat from the other coastal mm -hmm. areas along the Pacific. Whew, that was a lot of information, so let's just skip over to the list of notable places. Some of the top places you okay. guys, the Russian geography suggested we mention in the video, include places like Dargov's City of the Dead, Lenin's Mausoleum, Ismail of a Kremlin, mm -hmm. Moscow metro stations, the mm. Temple of All Religions, the Tsar Bell, the Dostoevsky Theater, the Vodka Museum in St. Petersburg, mm. Hotel Ukraina, <laughs> Bolshoi Zavatsky Island Maze, Freud's <gasps> Dream Museum, Whalebone Alley, the Sovolki Monastery and Army Base in Gulag, Ulan Ude Ethnographic Museum, oh, the mummified yes. remains of this mm. guy, the mm -hmm. most famous statue probably being the Worker and Kalhos. Mm -hmm. They even have yeah. the tallest statue of a woman in the world. There are, of course, so many churches, mostly Orthodox, yes. so many amusement and theme parks. And Micah, mm. the most top famous places would probably be the Red Square, St. Basil's mm. Cathedral, the Winter Palace, and Peter Hall. Mm -hmm. Alright, well that was a lot of heavy information. Russia is no joke when it comes to contrast. Much like the landscape, which yeah. brings us to... Now, when it comes to the physical makeup, Russia is kind of like an ice cream shop. I mean, yes, most of the country experiences cold and freezing temperatures, but being the largest country on Earth area-wise means you're going to have a lot of different mm. physical regions, so it's kind of like different flavors of cold, right? What do you think, Mike? <laughs> one, the country starting in the west begins with the flat and relatively lush European plain. From there, you have the Caucasus Mountains in the southwest, where you can find the highest point, the tallest point in Europe, Mount Elbrus. Just to skip away, you find the Volga River Delta, the largest delta in Europe, fed by the Volga River. The Caucasus and Ural Mountains together make up the boundaries of what is considered European Russia. And from there, Asia begins with this massive area known as Siberia, divided into the yeah. West Siberian Plain, where the mighty Ob River flows, the North Siberia, Siberian lowland and the central Siberian plateau. Just south along the border of Mongolia, you have the Sayan and Yablonovi mountains, where you can find the largest lake of Russia and the deepest yeah. in the world, Lake Baikal, mm -hmm. which, by the way, has some of the only freshwater seals on Earth. It is fed by a tributary on the longest river of Russia, the Lena, which flows northward into the Arctic. From there, you have all these other mountain ranges that shield the Kolyma lowlands, and finally, you reach the highly volcanic Pacific coast with the Koryak and Kamchatka ranges that extend with an 
archipelago southward, all sitting on the Ring of Fire. In fact, the Kamchatka and disputed Kuril Island chain have more volcanoes out of anywhere else in the country at about 200, about 60 of which are still active. The three most active and continuously erupting ones being Karimsky, Kizimen, and Shivoluch. Keep in mind, up north, the Arctic Ocean is actually divided into five separate seas on the Russian side, the Chukchi, the East Siberian, the Laptev, Kara, and Barents Sea. And here you can also find the northernmost point of Russia's domain, the Franz Josef Land Islands. They are right above Nova Zemlya, which has the largest glacier in Europe, and also the site where the largest atom bomb ever was dropped. Fun fact. Amidst all this land, about 60% of it is classified as being part of the Siberian taiga or taiga forests, which are forests situated in colder climates with deciduous trees like oak, birch, and spruce. This is the largest forested area on Earth, yes, even bigger than the Amazon. Much of the south of Russia is classified under the steppe region zone, or massive expanses of grassy land with few trees, ideal for agriculture with moderate temperature and sunshine and moisture. Otherwise, the further north you go, the less hospitable the conditions get, and you reach the tundras course, and cold yeah. deserts, where very mm. few people dare to live, but many resources are locked away, such as oh, the numerous oil and gas reserves hidden in the interior live, and offshore sir. sites in Siberia and the Arctic. Russia actually has the largest natural gas reserves in the world, making them the largest natural gas yeah. exporter and the largest oil producer in the world. Most of these petroleum resources are managed by state-owned companies like Gazprom, Lukoil, mm. and Rosneft. Whew, lots of land and mm. lots of stuff happening in it. Russia's mm. economy ranks as the 11th largest by nominal GDP and 6th largest by purchasing power parity in 2020. Back to resources though, agriculture in Russia is kind of limited. Only about 0.1% of the 1 billion acres of arable land is used for permanent agriculture. And they only have a short two to four month harvest season. This is due to much of the area covered yeah. in full or semi permafrost, which is not ideal for crop production. One thing it does produce, though, are these interesting geological formations known as pingos, which uh, into massive craters, uh, which fill up into uh, ponds, uh, making the landscape the most trypophobic uh, triggering region on Earth. Oh, get it! But a lot of interesting things uh, they found the recently in this formations found all over along the taiga and steppe regions. Uh, this means uh, almost all farming happens in the southern areas mm. of Russia where the climate is slightly warmer and accommodating. Nevertheless, even with the limited industry, Russia still ranks number one in producing certain crops such as buckwheat, barley, oh, oats, yeah. sugar beet, yeah. currant, gooseberries, uh, and raspberries. In addition, they are the largest palladium and diamond producer in the world. When you think of Russia immediately, you think of coal. I mean, they do have the coldest inhabited town. Yeah. But Russia actually has the largest temperature range on Earth recorded as well. The town of Berkhoi does summers. from in summer to negative 68 in winter, making a 105 degree difference. Technically, the fringes of the Caspian Sea in the south are also considered semi-arid desert zones, making mm -hmm. them some of the warmest regions in all of Russia. And some of the surrounding landscapes you could swear were in northern Africa or the Middle East with sand mm -hmm. dunes and camels. And speaking of camels, animals. The country has camels, over 260 yeah. mammal species and nearly 800 bird species. Animals you may have heard of, such as the Siberian tiger, mm -hmm. Asiatic black bears, Eurasian mm -hmm. lynx. In the tundra regions, you can also find polar bears, reindeer, yeah. Yes. Walruses, narwhals, arctic mm. foxes. Mm. Warmer areas, you have wolverines, as well as that strange saiga ant mm. with mm. its weird elongated nose. Of course, mm. it wouldn't be Russia without the national animal, the Eurasian brown bear. So yeah, Russia. It has deserts, and it can be over 100 degrees, imploding permafrost, and active yeah. volcanoes constantly erupting as we speak. And finally, to finish all of this segment off, food. Now, of course, due to the vast, oh. wide domain and numerous ethnic groups found in Russia, the country has an enormous range of regional cuisines. Oh, uh, yes, of course. That Russians tend to pickle a lot of their vegetables yeah, yeah, yeah. since the harvest season is short and crops are not yeah. available in the colder months. Anyway, just add a dollop of sour cream to your soups, take a shot of mm -hmm. vodka, and bam, you're into the Russian zone. Some of the more widely known and popular dishes you guys, the Russian geography suggested, stroganov, blinli, yeah. chicken kiev, mm -hmm. gutsi, lots mm -hmm. of different types of rye bread, rye many bread. types of pirate. They have their own but do ice cream and meringue they desserts. really caviar is a big deal in Russia. Right, bread so much. Yes. We're a big soup and salad culture. You have things like she, borsh, salyanka, shivelevi, salads. I think they prefer more yeah, white bread still, no? It's it's not a party unless that salad's involved. They yes, of course. Right? No, there was a Belgian guy who worked in a Russian restaurant mm -hmm. and then one of his sous chefs. Oh, well, it's a still it's already now, a absolutely different salad. Because Russia has over but, 180 yes. recognized ethnic groups which each have their own distinct culture. Speaking of which, I think that's just about the right time to transition to 
in the mm -hmm. the Russian people, Fyodor Dostoevsky once said, It's frightening to see how free a Russian man's spirit is, how strong his will. Being a Russian carries a powerful meaning to the Russian people. It's a title of honor and pride many of them take. The country is made up of about 143 million people. Mm -hmm. It is the most populous nation in Europe, and as of yeah, today, the course, ninth largest yeah. country in population on Earth. About 80% mm. of the country mm. identifies as ethnically Russian, and the remaining 20% come from one of the 180 or so ethnic minorities found throughout the country, the largest one being the Tatars at about 3.7%, yes. and Ukrainians at about 1.4%. <laughs> from there, you have everything else from the Bashkirs, Chuvash, Karelian, mm -hmm. and so on. Keep in mind, many of these minority groups are East and Central Asian in their heritage, like yes. the Yakut and Tuvan and Altai peoples who speak Turkic or Mongolic based languages mm -hmm. and are not Caucasian like the majority of people that identify as Russian. They use the Russian ruble as their currency, mm -hmm. they use the types C and F plug outlets, and they drive on the right side of the road. Russian, of course, is the national language. However, mm -hmm. the republics are allowed to have their own co-official languages as well. Oh, and speaking of which, Russian cursive is like the most mind-blowing sight to see. Now, with Russia, you have a lot of backstory, <laughs> but the best way to probably start off is by understanding the Slavs. In Europe, there are three main powerhouse ethno-linguistic groups. The Germanic, the Latin, and the Slavic. Slavs are the largest one, and Russians make up the highest population of Slavs. Mm -hmm. The roots are documented from Roman times, and they have spread all throughout Eastern, Central, and Southern Europe. With the exception of a few outliers like Poland and Croatia, the majority of Slavs in the world have a background in Orthodox Christianity, which was kind of like a further stem thing from the Byzantine Empire. If you don't know what any of that stuff is, basically in like the 4th century, Europe was like, Oh no! I'm dying! The Germanic people keep attacking! I'm losing money, and nobody wants to claim Caesar as divine. Help me, my predominantly Hellenistic Greek influenced subjects to the east. Psh, good luck. Psh. <laughs> I'm doing my own thing. I also made my own capital. And I'm ditching that polytheistic stuff for Christianity. And then in the 11th century, it was like... So, what's your problem? Why do you want to split up? Well, besides the secondary dogmas we disagree on, we mostly don't like your practices. We don't think the Pope has any authority over the church. Yeah, but you guys have patriarchs. Yeah, but that's not the same thing. Those are like regional managers. Also, you guys have way too many creepy statues. We believe priests should be allowed to marry, and we kind of like growing up our beards. Well, yeah, well, at least we play actual musical instruments during mass. There's a lot more that goes into it, but getting into the theological discrepancies between the two would take forever to explain. In any case, less than half of the population of Russia actually mm -hmm. adheres to the faith, and about 30% of the country identifies as either spiritual but not religious, or unaffiliated agnostic or atheist. Aside mm -hmm. from all that, it is important to note that not everybody in Russia is Slavic or Orthodox. I already made of a video course. explaining about these, so we don't really have to talk too much about it. Ah, yes, there's another video. Turkic, Mongolic, Circassian, mm -hmm. Uralic, and even Inuit peoples mm -hmm. in the far north mm -hmm. east Arctic regions. They even have the westernmost Buddhist community and... on Earth in Kalmykia. Interesting, but you didn't know that. Now, compared to the rest of Europe... And Russia it is really Russia important to preserve Russia. all these different the languages, they uh, cultures... Uh, a relatively high death rate, especially... Everything. In fact, today, women outnumber men in Russia at a 1 to 0.84 ratio. Yeah, there's a lot more women. In Russia, the competition amongst women is... Kind of visible, uh, you explain. It's no, not uncommon to see women dressing up in full presentation. It's most likely women after 80 years, years. To dive further into this social dynamic, you have to kind of understand, Russia has gone through a lot of eras throughout its history. Basically, they've had kingdoms, invasions, expansions, wars, empires, unions, and the most notable era, the 20th century communist era. The word has an almost mm -hmm. ridiculous connotation with the country of Russia. This is why you hear a lot of those distinct Soviet communist era words and phraseologies used in media like proletariat, bourgeoisie, means of labor, comrade. They were the first nation to extensively kick off and implement the political ideology constitutionally after the October Revolution, and furthermore, they spread it abroad. I mean, mm. that's kind of what the whole Warsaw Pact and Eastern Bloc things were during the Cold War, and it goes even further than that. All right, we just destroyed those Nazis. Awesome job, man. You know, Russia, it was really cool working with you. You're all right. Yes, my drug. It was quite pleasure destroying real enemy. Well, I guess my European friends and I should help Germany set up a free market system, privatize their corporate policy, and stimulate the cash flow through competitiveness to get them back on their feet. No, me and my friends will help set up collective system that mobilizes and encourages proletariat to function efficiently by state regulations with no independent red tape loopholes. Oh, shit. Is this really happening? Da. I believe it is. I take east, you take west. And in the 50s, it was like... I influence north, 
you influence South. And in the 70s, I support North. I support South. And so on. Which begs the question, what exactly is communism? Although there are many schools of thought and varying definitions, in the shortest way of summarizing, communism is a philosophical, political, social, and economic ideology movement derived much from the writings of Karl Marx. The ideal ultimate goal is to establish a common ownership and means of production by the people and the state. Well, actually, if you think about it, the idea is maybe not a bad idea, but... The first dibs and distributes what it deems as most efficient, technically, kind of, but not... It, it's weird, it's weird. Anywho, it after didn't the fall of the Soviet Union in 91, they well, changed their humans. system of operation. Legislatively, on paper, Russia classifies itself as a federal dominant party semi-presidential constitutional republic with an emphasis on okay. a heavily state-run economic model and Russian conservatism as a popular ideology. This party, okay. United Russia, holds about three quarters of the seats in the Federal Assembly. And it's semi-presidential because the president is head of state. Well, okay, I don't want to... Oh, it's a lot more complex than that. Mike, that. What would you say? <laughs> I so, don't care this is a country about that politics. is notoriously known for changing the rules as they play the game. I sort of see well, it man. as an oligarchy. Okay, so that being said, <laughs> let's highlight some of the notable cultural traits and accomplishments that Russians are known for. Yeah. One, Russians were pioneers in the space race and kicked off the age of yeah. space exploration. Here's my buddy Destin from Smarter Every Day talking about it. Alright, Paul, if you're going to talk about Russia, you've got to talk about aerospace engineering because they are impressive. It all started back in the day when a Russian visionary named Tsiolkovsky came up with this momentum balance for rockets, which came to be known as the rocket equation. Back in the early days of space flight, the Soviet Union kicked off the space race by launching Sputnik, the first satellite in space. Well, you know, space one good thing you when the first you really two big, big countries have this uh, competition the United States uh, are not just about everything. There's a At least partnership it between the two nations. No matter what political situation is going on on the ground, these engineers, NASA and the Russian Aerospace Institute, have been working together to make human space exploration uh, possible. Uh, the International Space Station, one of the most amazing things ever made by humans, has been a platform for persistent human presence in space since the late 1990s. I love this thing. Also, the Russian Soyuz spacecraft developed in the early 70s has proven itself to be the workhorse of human space flight. This stuff is awesome. Thanks for letting me say that. If you're doing a video about Russia, you have to talk about rocket. Scientific discoveries and progress. Yes, at least it's good for that. <laughs> Russians are good at rockets. Why don't you have a yeah. segment for each country about the rocket center? Like, you're, I know how you edit. You're going to cut me off now. There should, you can have it. And aside from the space race, there are many discoveries and inventions attributed to Russian innovators. Here's just a few of them that we will put on a full screen montage. They even invented the game Tetris. Ah. Their theme song is a Russian folk song called Karabeniki. Ah, this dude, Mendel, have also created the earliest mm -hmm. form of the periodic table, and some elements are actually named after Russians and Russian places, including the guy mm. himself. They're also the pioneers of stem cell research and numerous surgical mm. procedures like heart and lung transplants. Even amongst the diverse republic areas, there are some universal Russian customs and traits that transcend regional boundaries. All Russians take holidays and festivals very seriously and enjoy their times of celebration. Christmas was effectively brought up to New Year's and instead of Santa Claus, they have Dim mm. Maros, <laughs> basically translates to Grandfather Frost. Later iterations give them a little sidekick, Snigurichka. Otherwise, mm. all over you have other festivals celebrated mm -hmm. like these women's day is a huge mm -hmm. one it's a common misconception that russians are genetically acclimated to the cold explain we just handle the cold better because we bundle up better but you guys do have that like banya sauna culture mm -hmm. you guys jump into the ice water a lot right oh yeah in addition russians are known for excelling in a range of sports most notably ice hockey wrestling figure skating and gymnastics they have consistently ranked high in the olympics and ranked the number one medal winners twice for the winter seasons of 1994 and 2014 where they hosted in Sochi. Which has a stream of following controversies. Chess is a huge part of their culture. The game of cold logic rewards cunning and has always spoken to the Russian. Some of the top chess players in the world have come from Russia. The 1830s Romantis era was sort of seen as like the golden age of Russian writing. Mm. Some of the top notable authors like Dostoevsky, Tolstoy,
Tolstoy, Chekhov, given the honor and prestige of Russian literature. Russians have an incredibly long Rolodex of folk music that dates back centuries, and many native instruments are still used to this day, like the Bayan accordion, the which is gold, like the Domra, Gusli, mm -hmm. and the most famous mm -hmm. of all of them, the triangle-shaped balalaika. Mm -hmm. Every region has their own style of dance, but the most internationally well-known styles probably being the troika and prisyatka. Russians know mm -hmm. how to put on a show. The world-renowned Russian ballet has been operating oh, since yeah. the late 17th century, and everyone knows that Russians are some of the best circus performers in the world, excelling in acts like juggling, acrobatics, contortion. Russia has many artists spanning across mm -hmm. a wide spectrum of genres, movements, and styles. Russia also has a history of animation. It wasn't until 1935 yeah. that Soyuz Multfilm, Russia's largest animation studio, was started. We all grew up on this. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, what are some last minute things you would like to tell us about uh, what it means to be Russian, Mike? Without trying to be dismissive, Russians kind of like to fetishize their own suffering. It's like Russians don't live, they survive. Or other things. It's considered weird to smile at Oh, uh, well, yeah. We don't trust Maybe. <laughs> Never give a knife as a gift. It's seen as a severing of ties. Russians are a very oh. hospitable folk. Many will invite you into their homes and will display either sadness or offense if you refuse. Once you've made it in, they will often bribe you to stay with things like tea, conversation, booze. In Russia, middle names are not chosen by their parents. You are born with one. It is your paternal name. So, my father name is Yuri, therefore my middle name is Yurivich. And that applies to women as well? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Women, you get a male name for your middle name. All right, and with that said, here's a brief condensed history of Russia. Early dispersed Slavic tribes. I don't Urus see Urus it unifies them. as a Yemen middle Rus. name. Vladimir it's just a better name. Mongols invade. Ivan the Great. Ivan the Terrible. House of Romanov yeah. begins. Peter the Great. Catherine the Great. Crimean War. Serfdom abolished. Alaska sold to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Russo-Japanese War. World War One. Rise of the Soviet Union with Lenin's Bolsheviks. Royal Romanov family is deposed. As depicted by that incredibly accurate cartoon, COMMUNISM! Lenin dies. His body is weirdly involved and put in display, but okay. Stalin dictator years. World War Two. Germany breaks agreement and tries to invade Russia. Big mistake. <sighs> Cold War begins. Nuclear arms race and space race with the USA. Cuban Missile Crisis. Summer Olympics in Moscow. Gorbachev reforms and wins a Nobel Peace Prize. Boris Yeltsin wins first popular presidential election. Fall of Soviet <laughs> Union. Chechnya unsuccessfully tries to break away. Putin voted in for the first time, serves two terms, then after a brief hiatus, voted in a third time. Business and digital era boost Russia's economy. Georgia-Russia war. Russian troops take over Crimea. Controversial <laughs> referendum. And here we are today. Now, there's a lot more we could have expounded on, but there isn't enough time, so if you'd like to add anything, please write it in the comments. In any case, we've already mentioned some famous Russians in this episode, but here's a list of some more notable Russians, historic and modern. Some of the most famous <laughs> authors include people like these, but the most famous ones might be Alexander Solzhenitsyn, Vladimir Nabokov, Nikolai Gogol. A lot of famous actors and directors, but some of the top ones being people like Vlada Rumyanova, Anatoly Papanov, Vladimir Vysotsky, Andrei Mironov, Anton Yelchin, Ala Pugacheva, Valery Sutkin, Boris Gribinshikov, statesmen and war heroes like Alexander Nevsky, Georgi Zhukov, Mikhail Kutuzov, Valentina Tereshkova, Vasily Zaitsev, Alexander Pakrishkin, tons of athletes, like these. Of Yashin, course, yeah. Korbut, Irina Rodnina. And there's a lot more. Please add them in the comments if we missed any. Yeah, those are just my favorites. As you can see, Russia <sighs> is not just a country, but almost like its own world in itself. Yeah. And speaking yeah. of the world, that brings us to. Mm -hmm. Now, with Russia, diplomacy has played a very big role throughout the past few centuries, even before Cold War times. As a transcontinental nation, they've always had kind of their hands in both European and Asian affairs, but it doesn't really stop there. For Africa, seven countries had governments that were actually influenced by Marxist ideology mm. brought in partially by Russians during Cold mm. War times. These countries developed the closest ties diplomatically with Russia. It also explains why the flags of Angola and Mozambique have images. Ah, that's why Africa. so many Asia, African students. Are in Russia, yeah. East of the Today, four countries in Asia are categorically classified as either constitutionally communist or led by a communist party, primarily influenced by what was back then communist Russia. They are China, North Korea, or the DPRK, Vietnam, and Laos. Russia is one of the few countries that had ties to North Korea after the Korean War, as they influenced certain aspects of their Juche ideology. And even during the most isolated years, Russians still had relatively easier access to North Korean travel and business. During war times, Russia also played a pretty strong role in the influence of various sides in Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. Today, Vietnam is one of the favorite hotspots for Russian tourists in Southeast Asia. With China, mm. relations are generally amicable, although in the 50s, there was the massive Sino-Soviet 
split in which China mm. was like, look, Russia, it's cool you introduced the concepts, but we're going to run communism our own Chinese way, and we don't need mm. you to chime in anymore. Nonetheless, today, China is one of their closest allies and biggest trading partners. Which is mm. interesting because yeah. with India, relations have been relatively good after the mm. Indo-Pak war, in which Russia sided with India against Pakistan, who is an ally with China. And today, Goa is a huge hotspot for mm. Russian yes. tourists as well. Either way, all three are members of the BRICS countries, which also include Brazil and South Africa. Five emerging world regional powers that have agreements on things like mutual benefit mm -hmm. and development. Cuba and Venezuela mm -hmm. are probably the best Latin American friends, Cuba being the only country in the Americas that fully adopted mm -hmm. communism and played an important role in the Cold War tensions. With Venezuela, it's a little complicated. Under the Chavez years, Russia was close with trade and military cooperation, but after his death, Russia vied to support the succeeding Maduro presidency, which was seen as invalid by many across the world, and from there, things got even more complicated <sighs> amidst the protests, and Russia vowed to support Maduro's side even more if military action was required. The USA is like the forbidden friend shaking hands together with both fingers crossed behind their backs. Politically, everything has to be incredibly strategic and not all the rules apply when they play. After the Cold War ended in 1991, relations warmed significantly, but then the US involvement in Central and Eastern Europe made Russia distrustful again, especially with the 1999 NATO interventions in the Balkans. From there, it's a back and forth ping pong game. Uh -huh. I'll set up missiles in Poland, I'll build a base in Venezuela, I'll flirt with Ukraine, I'll give asylum to Snowden, and so on. As people though, the Russians and Americans actually get along pretty well. The USA has the fourth largest population of Russians in diaspora, and many famous Americans have Russian ancestry. When Americans meet a Russian, they might curiously ask questions about what being Russian is like, but at the end of the day, they enjoy the same drunken shenanigans. Ukraine is kind of like the best frenemy with Russia. They have the largest population of Russians outside of Russia at over mm -hmm. 8 million, and it is incredibly complicated. Mm -hmm. Putting all the controversial yeah. areas aside, like Crimea and Donetsk, Ukrainians and Russians may not always get along on paper, but they have an incredibly long history and they understand yeah. each other very well. It's even more interesting when a Ukrainian and Russian marry each other. When it comes to their best friends, however, most of you guys, the Russian geographies, mention three countries, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Serbia. Serbia, in essence, is kind of seen as like Russia Jr. with a little Balkan spice. Both were once communist powers in their own right, both follow the Eastern Orthodox mm -hmm. brands of Christianity, both write in the Slavic mm -hmm. alphabet with few differences, both are opposed to the whole Kosovo thing, and Russians are welcome with open arms in Serbia. Mm -hmm. Serbians even sometimes say they are one of the 300 million, referencing the entire Russian That's global population actually. domestically and abroad. Kazakhstan and Belarus have always had close ties, and the Russian language well, is Belarus, yes, but their Kazakhstan. Country, for former USSR states. Kazakhstan mm. has a second largest population of mm -hmm. Russians abroad at over 3.6 million, and they are kind of seen as like the breadbasket country to Russia, mm. as their environment is more suitable for agriculture. Many food supplies come to Russia from Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. Belarus is like Russia's girlfriend who takes many cues from her boyfriend's lifestyle. The heads of state even play hockey together. The majority of Belarusians actually speak Russian instead of their native tongue, Belarusian. This in return, however, has kind of prompted a sort of re-Belarusification period for the country, and they are now trying to reclaim their roots instead of just imitating Russia. Nonetheless, Belarus will always be one of Russia's biggest cheerleaders. In conclusion, Mike, I think you should take this. Russia is an old and contradictory country. Yeah. It's beautiful, but scarred. Eloquent and clumsy. Cunning and simple. Its people are proud, but damaged. Resilient and defensive. Russians are unique, but numerous. And if you should be so lucky to meet one, you'd be hard-pressed to forget them. <laughs> Stay tuned! Yeah, oh my god, there's so much what I could say. <laughs> and yeah, well, it's, this video is long, but at the same time, Russia, yeah, of course, it's the biggest country, and they have so many different cultures in Russia. And uh, what worries me is that uh, I want them to preserve all these unique languages and traditions and everything, because unfortunately, a lot of these. Um, well, indigenous, well, they are kind of indigenous people, but they saw these different people who are not Russian. Uh, sadly, they tend to forget their language and everything, and they become more Russian. And, well, this is something that is not good. Yeah, I think it is really important to preserve all this diversity and also it's interesting how when 
you think about Russia, you think well, at least how for me it is more like this very typical Russia, which is this European part, but there is also all this Asian part, which is also it's quite different even for, even for me. Yes, I am half Russian, but I never lived in Russia. I don't really know how. I never experienced how it is to live in Russia and to live in that culture. Despite that, yes, Latvia was a part of Soviet Union, and of course, we are we have. Uh, Russians and Latvia, and yes, as I said, I am half Russian, and of course, we have these influences from Soviet times. I am familiar with uh, a lot of Russian food, but at the same time, there are things which are surprises me when I watch videos about Russia, about different types of food, like in Siberia or somewhere around there, which uh, I never knew about this and are so different uh, and I never tried a lot of actually Russian food, like not, not really Russian as Russian, but like from Russia. <laughs> yes, and uh, really, I would love to. I, yeah, I visited Russia only once. I don't really remember much. Uh, really, this is one of the countries which I want to visit. I kind of, yes, feel this connection to Russia. Uh, and there are so many places to see and And also, I do watch Russian YouTube channels, or videos, and uh, I actually grew up on Russian uh, TV and everything. So it kind of feels like, yes, it is a part of me, but at the same time, it's not because... For, especially now, I... I have no idea how it feels really to live there. So that's interesting, but but what I don't like about R Russia is all this politics and everything. It's yes, it's complicated. It's sad how some people some politicians, and not just in Russia, like everywhere, how they can ruin everything. <sighs> like, I don't understand how people who are sometimes not really very smart, uh, and uh, yes, as I said, I am not talking about Russia, but when you look at politicians around the world, very often these people, they don't have to be in politics because they either stupid or too egoistic or what, I don't know. They don't really do what I believe real politicians should do. So the, this is something, and also all these games which they are playing, United States and Russia between each other, when they split countries, like this part, United States, well, of course, it's not like they take this, this uh, different parts of other countries, they don't include them in their country, but they still try con to control and one half goes to Russia, another to not into United States. Like it's so, I don't know. I, I don't understand how grown-up and educated people can act like uh, small children. It's I I I really I can't understand it. Why it happens? It's for for me, it looks so stupid. Seriously. And they do that.
But yeah, maybe I don't understand. Well, yes, I don't understand politics. I don't. I, I like. I mean, I'm not even interested. It's of course it's hard to avoid uh, politics. Um, it, it's very often is a part of our lives. It, it affects our everyday life sometimes, but. And what happens in Russia with all this? What they had recently is this... Um, mm, a referendum or something about their constitution. Well... Uh, I... Uh, how? I don't really understand like Putin, he is a president, he must be a really well-educated person. He really thinks that people who live in Russia, his people, are so stupid or what? Like, absolutely no respect to the people. Of course, I believe, I know that there are people who support him. And well, that's that's fine, but what about all the other people? <laughs> like, ah, well, okay, okay, maybe I don't have to talk about it. Probably that's it. Um, thanks for watching and goodbye.